Welcome back to Dynamo's Dozen, the podcast that I bring you each and every single week where I talk about whatever may be on my mind from pro wrestling, sports, entertainment, music, movies, muesli, fresh socks and jocks, and everything in between, never forgetting the talk. And you are all very welcome back. But before we do go on, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, like the video, comment and let us know whether you like or dislike what we are about to discuss on this here show. And today I am joined once again. It is that time of year where we have our quarterly appearance from the great Finley Martin of the Power Slam podcast and, of course, Inside the Ropes and uh, writer, of course, for uh, the, the magazine as well. Um, and, of course, my right-hand man, Noel, has joined the show today because a lot of you boys and gals uh, have uh, you, you probably know over the last few weeks that there's been some shout outs to to the great Finley Martin from myself and Noel and Noel was happy to come on today and uh, you know maybe tell tell Finley that he got uh, he he pretty much got the Royal Rumble right so he, he he's looking for that uh, he's looking for that kudos not the coup de gras the kudos so um May, you know maybe he's gonna put me in my place possibly <laughs> but who knows what's gonna happen I, I... I could end up on the receiving end of a coup de gras, depending on how this one goes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thanks for having me back. I'm, I'm pleased to be here and looking forward to talking about uh, a range of topics. Yeah, a range I mean, of topics. It, it is, Finley. You, um, we always like to kind of uh, have a little bit of a diplomatic point of view when we're arranging your uh, your quarterly appearance sometimes it's in the build up to mania sometimes it's in the build up of a big pay-per-view we are of course on the road to wrestlemania but um we decided uh, when well, you you kind of come up with the concept that we should talk about brock lesnar a little bit in depth because we are coming up to 20 years of uh, the next big thing but now he is the big thing and uh, so i'm really looking forward to this um, Noel wanted to join in on this as well. Uh, we're all Brock fans, I think, at this stage. And um, But before we do, um, last night, by the time this airs, uh, it, it would have been last night, um, breaking news that pretty much a lot of people had, I suppose, uh, surmised or possibly um, guessed and maybe speculated would be probably the better word. That. Suspected. suspected, suspected, exactly. The, suspected. the worst kept secret in the business. The worst kept <laughs> secret that uh, Cody Rhodes and Brandy are now no longer with AEW. So one of the EVPs, two of the EVPs, are now gone from the company. Um, and I thought we should maybe just spend a couple of minutes talking about that and, and maybe speculate amongst ourselves. So Finley, you. Uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, trying to do my vocabulary, um, you know, justice in your presence. So uh, why don't you start off on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think his contract had expired or their contracts had expired in December. I sure. believe that's correct. It's accurate, and, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it was weird, wasn't it? Because it's it was sort of unimaginable that they would go, given that they were two of the founders effectively of the company they were evps they had jobs there pretty much as long as they wanted them yeah. they had the roads to the top gig that was a tie-in with you know dynamite and rampage and it just seemed i mean i imagine that was tony khan's um mindset as well was that yeah. well i'm not that eager to sign them to new contracts because it seems unlikely that they're going to leave you know, they've got a good spot here. They've got this reality TV show. I mean, why would they want to go back to WWE, a company that they couldn't wait to leave? I mean, as we all remember, I mean, Cody was stardust when he was last there. It seems like a lifetime ago now. Sure, yeah. And, um, you know, requested his contract release. Was that 2016? I think it was, wasn't it? I trust it? your judgment on dates and years. Yeah, yeah. So it was either that. 15 or 16 yeah. that they went. Yeah. I think it was, it was like one of those years. And, like, he was tired of being, like, a novelty act in the not even mid-card, more of a low-card player. And... Um, Sort of seemed unimaginable, yeah, inconceivable that they would want to return to WWE. 
Um, so I imagine that is the reason why there was no sense of urgency, you know, re-signing them to, to contracts or extending their contracts. Um, but no, yeah, as you said, the, uh, the news broke yesterday or today as we record this. Mm-hmm. Um, Cody put a statement out thanking everyone in AEW pretty much. Tony Khan put out a statement thanking uh, Cody and Brandy for everything they've done for the company and wishing them well. Didn't actually use the term future endeavours, but must have been tempted. And um, yeah, here we are. So now all eyes are on Cody and Brandy. And the assumption is with no, no compete clause, like what people have when they are uh, released from their WWE contracts is an 80 day no compete. These two, um, you know, theoretically could start working for WWE, you know, this weekend at Elimination Chamber. I mean, they're not going to, I'm sure, but theoretically they could. Interesting, isn't it, Noel? Because um, everyone that knows me and knows this uh, particular channel um, knows that I'm a massive fan of Cody. Uh, not so much Brandy. Um, I think she does her job. You know, she she's okay. I wouldn't. Um, I mean, she can play a good character, but I mean, in ring she wouldn't be. You know, I don't think she'd be in the conversation of, you know, the 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 great kind of women that are out there at the moment. In my own personal opinion, <laughs> um, I think that's fair to say, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be nice here, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, but she's she's definitely got, you know, she's chief branding officer and stuff like that. So she's obviously got her set of skills, and she 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 has, you know, a seat at the table, I guess, because she's been employed by, you know, by the two biggest companies. And um, but Cody, I suppose the question, Noel, is does Cody go back now to the WWE with his stock any higher? Now, it it might seem like a straightforward question. However, I have seen some debate. Um, I've seen the great Brian Last, of course, who is uh, not really a Cody fan, uh, who, who obviously is the uh, the host of, of Jim Cornette's podcast, and he, he kind of doesn't seem to think so. And some other people don't seem to think so, but then some other people do. So what say you, Noel? Um, does he go back to WWE with some lever- leverage and... Um, and power and, and has this been discussed do you reckon obviously if there is a yeah. contract I, I don't think so I don't think he goes back with, with leverage and power um, but I think he certainly goes back with his stock slightly greater anyway yes. so no doubt about it from when he left because when he left I mean part of the reason he left is because they had driven his stock so far down yeah. um, but I, <laughs> I think he's put on some fantastic wrestling in his time there he must be highly disappointed. I mean, there was a lot of talk that was coming out, and again, it's only speculation. We don't know it is the truth. That like, sorry, no, Cody's stock there. was so low, so low that they sent it back to the great bank crisis of two thousand and eight. Sorry, I have to say. When it. someone turns around to you backstage and says, "We have a great idea. You're gonna rock out with a mirror and a brown bag over your face. We're gonna call you dashing." Then it, you know, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> but I just think, I just think it's um like he's had some he's had some brilliant matches in there but he must be disappointed I mean a lot of the talk coming out was that he had kind of split away from the elite guys and he was quite isolated there and he was on his own and he wasn't as involved in company meetings and all that kind of stuff and um, so it obviously obviously there was a, a slight change in direction as well obviously for the company and I'm not sure whether it sat well with him but he must be disappointed I mean the effort he put in to get those the all-ins and the all-out shows up and going and the risk he took on those and everything mm. out there and stuff like like he really was the guy that those guys brought in to draw eyes to it and his back and forth with WWE is what embraced the indie crowd there to bring this kind of success to the place and like I mean we all talk about his match I mean his match in there with Dustin was as good a match as you'll see anywhere it was fantastic still for um, me still for me the, the, the best pro wrestling match in the last five years for me I have to say, yeah, and essentially in there anyway, oh, whatever anywhere, there or somewhere else, but in there anyway, yeah. certainly. And there was there was there was a lot of um, there was a lot of emotion to it and stuff like that. But I, you know, I I don't know what way this kind of works. I I think maybe he went out, he had a look at the landscape, and he's decided, you know, something. It's not what it was. Maybe he's going to take a bit of time out. Maybe he's not necessarily going to go straight back to WWE. Certainly, he would go back with his stock improved. Um. But I don't know whether it's improved to the point where 
he falls into that circle of a Roman Reigns and a Brock Lesnar and those type of guys at the moment. Maybe it'll take time he can go in there and build it up again, you know. Um, but I, I, I think, yeah, I think he's probably learned from the experience. Um, and if nothing else, I mean, that that's a positive for him, you know. Um, but I, I don't know, in terms of coming back, um, there's a lot of stuff that went on there, you know. I mean, the stuff that went on about the, the family name and all the other stuff that went on and you know, the smashing of the throne and all and the kick out well, of look, the I Triple mean, H and all that. Now, I know that happens. I yeah, know it happens. Look, I don't think but that's going to be it. I mean, the company wouldn't have taken him back if that was an issue, you know what I mean? It's, it's... Oh, oh, like, listen, I always say that if Bruno San Martino and Vince McMahon can bury the hatchet and the ultimate warrior and Vince McMahon can bury the hatchet. And Bret Hart. <laughs> and pre- yeah, and Bret Hart as well. The only person who never went back nails... Well, that's because yeah. Vince tried to grope him. <laughs> well, you know, apparently, I, I don't believe that to be true. Me neither. Me neither. I mean, there's better looking guys in the locker room than nails that Vince could have went after. You know, uh, what I mean? you know, I don't believe that story. I just don't. Yeah. Me neither. I think nails is an absolute lunatic. Sorry, I just thought that's a funny little segue. But yeah. uh, but he's about he's the he's the only guy that never went back. So I mean, if Bruno and the Warrior can bury the hatchet with Vince then Cody certainly can. Yes. So uh, none of that is going to be a bar to him returning. I mean, as far as him going back and being a huge star, well, I think they'll give him a chance to be a much bigger star than he was mm-hmm. because of who he was in AEW and also the optics. It's like, you know, for so long, the traffic was just going one way. Mm-hmm. WWE to AEW. And inevitably, at some point, some of the traffic was going to start going the other way. Mm. And one of the really big guns, now we don't know for sure if he's going to WWE, but it seems fairly obvious to me that he will. Yeah. But that is his destination. Yeah. The optics of this, you know, are, are what's important here for WWE, because this sends a message to people that uh, AEW people might not be as happy there as some people think they are. Well, obviously. Cody and Brandy have decided to leave. If they were overjoyed to be part of AEW, they'd still be there. So it's the messaging and the optics publicly. This is a huge win for WWE if they can hire Cody and Brandy. So assuming Cody goes back and Brandy, I'm sure, will make appearances as well. I mean, I'm not sure what she's going to do in WWE, but I imagine she will make some on-screen appearances. Um, With Cody, I think they'll give him a chance to be a star. Um, We'll have to wait and see as to how far he can go in that system. I mean, I personally don't think he's a top guy, but I mean, he'll be motivated to prove people like me wrong if he gets that big contract and that big opportunity with the main event players there. This will be the moment when Cody will have to prove that he really does belong, you know, with the elite in wrestling. And, you know, there is a... (laughs) There is a pun there, deliberate pun. The elite of WWE, I mean. I love it. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens if he does go back. But I think they'll give him a chance to show if he can make it at the top level in WWE. Uh, We'll see if he can. Well, in closing on that one, I just want to say uh, on a point that both of you kind of alluded to, um, Noel, you in particular, obviously the fallout with, you know, kind of, I mean, Cody was the real wrestling guy in the company, you know what I mean, before, um, obviously before Jericho came in. But Jericho kind of got into the nonsensical stuff and, you know, done the the kind of death matches and stuff, whereas Cody, for me, was always the traditionalist. And I always felt like looking in that group of kind of um, guys, you know, like Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks and stuff like that, that he was the traditionalist in there and it didn't necessarily you know, I always had this like kind of sneaking suspicion, which I think we, we, we have talked about on the podcast before that, you know, I wonder if this is for, um, you know, for marketing purposes and, uh, you know, just, I suppose to, to build a brand um, more, more than them being friends. Cause Cody never really seemed to take to the kind of jokey comedy uh, style of stuff. Like I, I, I would, I would agree with what you're saying that, you, you, you don't see him as a top guy. I think he can be, 
but not to the level, say, of a Roman Reigns or, you know, Brock Lesnar, or, you know, those absolute top guys. However, I do think he is one of the top five workers in the world, without a shadow of a doubt. I think on his day, it's very, very hard to, you know, pick many that are better in, in terms of putting on a great story and telling a great story, should I say, and putting on a great match. So I think he has that. Um, but, you know, he's not exactly going to, um, to a company that is all about in-ring storytelling either so yeah look i suppose watch this space see what happens and um listen we we will definitely wish them wish them luck and um hopefully he goes back and and as you say finley proves people wrong and makes a real yeah, yeah. success uh yeah. but on to the main event of course we are here today today to talk about the beast incarnate um 20 years of the Beast Incarnate, to be precise. Um, well, 20 years next month, if you want 20 to be, years next month, yeah. March 18th was when he... It was the night after WrestleMania 18 when he made his WWF TV debut. So uh, nearly on 20 years. Well, bring us into that then, Finley, because that's exactly where I was going to go with it. So bring us into that. Well, I mean, as people know, he was... Amateur great NCAA heavyweight wrestling champion, Division One, um, was hired by WWF. Um, WCW was also very interested, um, as were, I think, s- at least one Japanese company. And there was some talk that UFC might be interested as well. I think well. it was, was it all Japan at the time that were possibly looking to bring him in as. Uh... I, no. can't, I can't. I can't remember. No, me I would neither. More like, I would think more likely New Japan. Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And given all Japan's, you know, uncertain states at the time, because the Noah yeah. guys had left that year and yeah. later yeah. form the new promotion, and they yeah. were all Japan was was really struggling. But if there was, if if it was any new, it was, would have been New Japan. If it was, I know there was interest from from one Japanese. I just, company. I think, I thought at that time because I know, like before those guys left all Japan, I know they were trying to make a shake to try and get someone in, try and get some big names in, just to, you know to salvage something. But yeah, no, you're you're probably right. Anyway, it's absolutely. And plus, of course, he was he was untrained at that time, and he was going to be a project. Yes. So I mean, all Japan really wasn't in a position to no. <laughs> hire somebody, no. you know, and pay him to basically just train for the next yeah. year to eighteen months or whatever. So um, yeah, he was he was paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars just to train, which was seen as a huge sum of money at the time. And people were like, wow, I can't believe that this guy is just getting paid five grand a week just to train to be a wrestler, which was unheard of. Mm. Um, went to OVW, actually made his debut in um, October of 2000 uh, in a tag match. He originally formed a the tandem that were known as the Minnesota Stretching Crew. Shelton Benjamin, I believe. Shelton Benjamin was yep. in OVW. So he was there for... Um, he was there for like about 18 months or so in OVW, actually longer than that, obviously he was training for a while before he made his debut, but he was in OVW as a wrestler for uh, about 17, 18 months. Um, In the meantime, he wrestled in a lot of dark matches for WWF, um, TV tapings, uh, wrestled on house shows, famously uh, put Mr. Perfect over um, in 2002 on house shows. Um, They were obviously both from the great state of Minnesota, and, um, state, and then finally, state. you know, made his debut the night after WrestleMania 18, interrupted a hardcore title match, um, just entered the ring from the crowd, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler on commentary. Who's this guy? You know, what's going on here? You know, and then uh, Lesnar, you know, storms the ring, power bombs uh, Al Snow on a bin, destroys Maven, hits him with the F5. Hit Spike Dudley with, I think it was three power bombs. I mean, what a pasting. I mean, I've got to say, by the end of this brief run-in and beatdown of these guys, fans were already, you know, yeah. reacting to Brock. Yeah. They were already impressed. And then who's there at ringside? But Paul Heyman. Jim Ross is going mad on commentary. What's Paul Heyman doing here? He doesn't work here. He was fired the night after Survivor Series. So that was Lesnar's debut. And um, watching it again, 
I think it was um, you know, a really good way to introduce him. Um, do you two remember? You must remember Lesnar's yeah. debut at the time. Of course. Right? Poor, I watched it again Spike, today. Poor Spike Dudley. Good Lord. <laughs> he Listen, folded him in two. <laughs> oh, poor anybody that got on the wrong side or pissed Brock Lesnar off. Yeah, I remember this debut well. Um, I mean, it was like, because uh, like you, uh, Finn, I had been, um, obviously I was a power slam guy anyway, so I, I kind of knew you know what was coming up I, I pretty much had every wrestling magazine you could you could get so of course i my first um i suppose introduction to to those guys was getting a lot of the american wrestling magazines as well where the writing wouldn't been as great as um as yours truly as in you finn just to blow smoke um but you would get a lot of you would get a lot of great pictures though of the show yeah, you know yeah. the smaller shows because you know, the guys would be there at the OVW stuff. So I always remember that famous picture of Shelton Benjamin and Brock in the in the in the wine singlets with the silver trim. Yeah. And going, who in the name of good Lord is this guy? He is a monster. And of course, that was the great class of, <laughs> you know, what, 2002, 2003 with, with uh, obviously um, Randy Orton and John, John Cena, John, John Cena, the prototype. Yeah, Batista. Yeah, yeah. You know, what a what a class. What a class. And I what got a to, class. I, I I did at that time manage to get my hands on some um some tapes as well um from from a friend over in the states. We did a little bit of tape trading, so I got to get some grainy kind of tapes, which I still have in my possession somewhere. So it's it's kind of cool to have. And I remember Randy Orton used to always come out to that. Uh, Pantera t-shirt he just used to come out with a sleeveless Pantera t-shirt I think he thought he was Phil Anselmo at the time he had the shave you know he was like <laughs> just a, a real badass you know he used to come out to that song Becoming from Pantera which is actually uh, if you if you listen to the lyrics of it it literally sums Randy Orton up in, <laughs> in pretty much five minutes <laughs> so uh, yeah no uh, great memories uh, great great debut what a way to introduce yourself by just causing absolute destruction um, Noel, you're, you're, yeah, I, I, I just like, I mean, obviously he was trained by Kurt as well and Dean Malenko and Danny Davis. So like, I mean, you're you're in decent company there if you're being trained as well. But I always remember even the footage they showed. Remember in the yellow singlet when he was in the NCAA's and stuff like yes. that. And he was tearing your man asunder. Nineteen years often, of age. I often wanted to ask his mother, was he born with those fucking traps or what's the story? Because <laughs> he had them from when he was a kid and they were joining on. Can I say one thing on that, Noel? Didn't Joe Rogan give the best synopsis on that? Now, avert your ears, this is not a PG show. So these are words of Joe Rogan, not mine. Yes, we still appreciate Joe Rogan on this show. So uh, if, if, you know, if, if, if you don't want to hear any more, we've got your view anyway, so you can turn <laughs> off. <laughs> um, no, all joking aside, I, I am kidding, of course. Um, Joe Rogan said, when you look at a guy like Brock Lesnar, when he was in the UFC, he goes, every couple of thousand millennia, a mother shoots a Viking like Brock Lesnar out of her pussy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> his words not mine but realistically that's what Brock Lesnar is he's a Viking right he is somebody that if he was not a pro wrestler now and you went back a thousand years and there was a battle to be had on a cliff Brock Lesnar's the guy coming in going let's do it yeah he's yeah absolutely yeah I just I remember when you mentioned Joe Rogan there as well I think he had a fight in the UFC against Shane Carwin and Shane Carwin's a big guy himself like yes and Shane Carwin beat him up I think for the first round or two and then Brock got back into it and absolutely killed Carwin and I remember he was on top of Carwin absolutely mauling Carwin yes and I remember, I remember live, actually yeah. I remember I remember Rogan on commentary. One of the guys, I think it was in there with Rogan, said to Rogan, what exactly is Brock doing? And Rogan goes, he'll do whatever he wants. <laughs> and I just yeah. thought it was brilliant, like, you know. But it's just, um, yeah, he was just unbelievable. I remember you remember you used to come into the ring in OVW and you keep on doing this and all. I remember you keep pumping the traps up. Yeah. And like, yourself, like, huge. Well, I remember, I think it was WWF Raw magazine. They did a feature on him and it must have been just after they signed him. And there was a lot of photos of him um, from his amateur wrestling days. Yeah, yeah. And it was just all amateur. And I don't know whether it was from the NCAAs, but it was from some wrestling competition anyway, yeah. amateur wrestling competition. 
and he was already enormous. Yeah. And he was doing all like you know, like the Hulk Hogan, you know, pull smush, yeah, the yeah. Hulk Hogan pulls. Yeah. So he was like mugging for the cameras, and it was as if he was preparing himself for the pro game by doing all yes. the, you know, yeah. all the extra silly sort of you know crowd working stuff, crowd interaction techniques. Yeah. It's like he had them all down. He had it down to a fine art before he ever thought about or was signed to become a pro wrestler. So yeah. you could see that he was somebody that was probably going to do well in, in, in pro wrestling. Well, I mean, you never know from a picture. He certainly had the he certainly had the look and he certainly had the crowd interaction stuff down to you know a fine art before he ever began training for pro wrestling. Of course, you never know if someone's going to make it as a pro wrestler until they start training to be a pro wrestler, because you know, some people just don't get it and you know it's you know let's face it when you watch pro wrestling you see some people have been doing it for a long time and you look at her and think she or he doesn't just doesn't really grasp what they're supposed to be doing it's yep. not an instinctive thing it's like everything is kind of labored mm -hmm. and it's not they're not just doing what they should do next if they really get it they're sort of oh, but there again also in 2022 because in some promotions everything's laid out move for move Probably part of that as well is the machinery upstairs trying to remember what they're supposed to be doing next. Yeah. So I always think that's a hindrance as well for wrestlers. Yeah, um, I think uh, I've been in the ring with a lot of them, both in the UK and in Ireland. And, uh, you know, you see some guys that look a million bucks and you get in there and you're like literally trying to just get a, you know, a wrist lock on and their arm is just stiff. And you're like, loosen up, bro. You know, like you give the old little kind of nudge under the arm to try and say hey listen up and you're trying to get closer and it's just they don't get it and you're 100 correct it's it's um the, the the really great ones are the ones that kind of really had a passion for it or have great ears and by that i mean they can listen and case mm. in point kurt angle um yeah you know that that's that's literally the two components it's the people that grew up with a passion for it and of course there is people that grow up with a passion for it that aren't that they just you know they, they can't do the brain doesn't send the signals to the body the way they want to yeah and it's like it's like footballers but then you've got but but nine out of ten you'll find that the guys that are really passionate about it and put the work in you know they they, they have grown up on, on the business the ones that you see make it that were scouted by jim ross because they were big guys or athletes you know the success ratio of those guys is very few and far between in the modern era. Um, and I say the modern era because there's a lot more required. Of course, they would have been okay in the 80s because they were just there to do a job and look a certain way. Yeah. Um, but the reason I say the ears is because someone like a Kurt Angle or a Brock who weren't not necessarily pro wrestling fans didn't really respect it a whole lot but knew that yeah. there was money to be made once they got into the business, they opened their ears yeah. and they went, okay, well, if I'm in it, I may as well try and be the best at it. And that really comes down to your determination to be the best at whatever field you're in. Really? I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah. It's, it's a funny business like that, isn't it? And you yes. can just see the people, some people, you know, can learn it. And, yeah. and you know, there's some people the years where we've seen people who just, like, for instance, I always remember Trish Stratus just being atrocious. Like, yes. in like I mean, you know, in 2001, yeah. even, even into 2002. Dreadful. She started getting a feel for it by 2002, but then she had yeah. that unbelievably awful mixed tag match that year with opposite Jackie Gerda, uh, like one of the worst matches ever. And... Um, and, he, and like even by 2003, you see, she didn't really get it. And at some point, like 2004, 2005, it was as if the light bulb went off. Yes. And um, and she could then put a match together. And it was kind of amazing to see the transformation. And just I'm not saying, you know, she's at the level of people who are around now because it's obviously very different. I mean, I don't know. Did either of you see the Charlotte Flair Naomi match on SmackDown last week? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, what a match. I mean, absolutely tremendous. No, I mean, Charlotte... went up in my in my book after oh. that. Yeah. I mean, like Trish Stratus on her best day could never have had anything half that good. But in her day, by the standards of the time, she she wasn't yes. really good. And she did teach herself how to do a match and to do a match professionally. 
And, you know, I got a lot of respect for her for doing that. Well, she became she a somebody... better worker. She became a better worker, in my opinion, than Lita was because Lita was oh, like one yeah, trick absolutely, pony. Yeah, and and absolutely. yet Lita loved pro wrestling. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. it, it, it really boils down to A, the kind of, I suppose, the athletic ability, but B, knowing what way to position yeah. your body and stuff. And that's kind of why I alluded to, you know, I've been around so probably, I'd say, well in, into the high hundreds of people over the course of you know my time mm. of seeing guys that you go like Noel, you've seen guys come into your shop and they go whoa he looks good but then mm. it comes down to training and, and yeah. a can't cut it b can't handle you know the pressure of it or can't handle the the pain of it i suppose um or c just doesn't have drive you know what i mean that's yeah. really really what it all boils well, that's down my- to. It's, it's making that connection as well, isn't it? You know, that connection with the crowd. When you talk about Trish Stratus, she always looked great. Yeah. Oh, well, 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 well. what are we trying to say you, here? What are we trying only, to it's, say it's, here? It's only that time where you mentioned Finley, where she found out that connection with the crowd as well. And then she started working towards that as well. And yeah. that came into it a lot, which got her over an awful lot as well, you know? So it's, and I, that's, that's what a lot of them as well. Like you see it even now with Roman, how Roman has figured himself out. Oh. You know what I mean? And he's yeah. just unbelievable now. Brock is somewhat going through that now as well, the way he has changed things up. He's found a way, like, and that connection that he has there now. Go back two, three years ago, everyone was saying, oh, this guy's coming back again. No one wanted him there. Like, they were going, well, this part-time. Before was, we get now to look that at him ex- now, we can't get enough of him. Before no. we get to that exciting yeah. part of Brock's uh, career, we're going to take a little break. Mm-hmm. And what we'll do is we'll kind of maybe... We won't go too in depth, but what we do, we'll we'll kind of look at uh, Brock's journey. We'll try and give people the fast track, but we're not gonna, you know, this is yeah. That fast track rise to nineteen is unbelievable. Exactly. So unbelievable. we're gonna take a little break, and when we come back, we're gonna we're gonna talk more Brock Lesnar and his journey to becoming probably um, the biggest, or arguably uh, the biggest star on the planet. The, the big thing. The big thing. The now current big thing. <laughs> so we'll be back right after. Nothing. Welcome back to Dynamo's Dozen, where we are talking about the great and current Brock Lesnar, of course, with Finley Martin, myself, Ian Dynamo Kelly, and Noel Hogan, uh, the shopkeeper to you. <laughs> um, we're talking about Brock, obviously. Um, obviously, he came in, won King of the Ring, kind of very, very much so fast tracked. Um, to you know, to start him basically. Obviously, Vince saw dollar signs in this boy with both his unique look and um, his kind of natural charisma in a very, very different way. Not charisma in the sense of like being the best talker in the world, but just a natural charisma in terms of his look, his aura, and his presence. Um, and he really was kind of you know, let's get into SummerSlam, you know, with The Rock. For example, yeah, I mean, yeah, and also we should just point out that Brock didn't need to speak at first because he had the main man Paul Heyman by his side, didn't best he? Talker in the game, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, Thanks but uh, but yeah, there was King the King the Ring win, and and then that led to SummerSlam two thousand two, which um, they promoted with an old school actual sports style training videos didn't they do you remember that with yeah. Brock training and Brock training and it was do you remember they did that for Brett and Sean didn't they? that was the last the time that was done 1996 yeah the Anaheim Pond yeah 100% yeah yeah so I mean and it was really dynamic and you felt like you were you were there was this, this battle of the titans between these two guys who were at the peak of their performance and um it was a real I mean Summer Sam 2002 was an amazing show really good show um and i wasn't convinced that that main event would succeed and there was so much else on the show that was really good i was thinking are they going to be able to you know are they going to be able to sort of headline the show effectively are they going to be able to follow everything on the undercard and it ended up being a huge success for brock partly because the rock was booed because the audience had worked out that he was leaving i mean we all remember that right yeah, it was incredible. That was incredible. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, I remember watching it kind of live as well. We used to always make sure we had Sky Box Office. Just press the button. Doesn't matter who's paying the bill. Let's <laughs> put it. Doesn't matter they, who's paying till the bill comes in. Then the bill comes <laughs> in. It's like, Ian, um, you owe me 20 quid. 
I do. <laughs> I do, Dad. You're 100 percent correct, sir. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, um, yeah, the facts had worked out the rock was leaving um to do uh, you know, because he'd done had the Scorpion King come out that year, 2002? I think it had, hadn't it? Because the yeah. previous year was The Mummy Returns. Yeah. And he had that little cameo in that, didn't he, at the start? Yeah. yeah. And then there was The Scorpion King, which I think came out April 2002, I think it was. Um, it, that is actually the only Dwayne Johnson movie I have seen in its entirety, if you can believe that, The Scorpion King. The only film of, of his that I've seen all the way through. Only I've tried to watch some of his other movies and I've just had to turn them off. Uh, but I mean, yeah, that SummerSlam main event was was superb, and Brock Lesnar just came. Out. I, I was I was almost thinking, oh my God, Brock's just going to be eaten alive by by the Rock. You know, the fans are going to side with Rock, and they're going to you know boo Brock, but, but in a resentful way, not in a heel heat way. They're almost going to reject him, and then he was the one who was actually cheered. Rocky was the one who was booed. Um, and obviously, at the end of the night, Lesnar was the new champ. I mean, it was a meteoric rise. Yeah. Made his debut officially the night after WrestleMania 18 and was champ at SummerSlam. I mean, that just showed the level of, you know, devotion and expectation that Vince McMahon had of his, um, of his you know, his, somebody who was still in his rookie year on the main roster. Yeah. Well, well, let's go. You're also in your also looking at rock there as well thinking do you know something i worked a few months ago with hogan maybe cool yeah yeah i mean i suppose we we, we can kind of fast track in terms of all of his accolades you know because you'd be going through match for match all this kind of stuff obviously uh the famous match with with himself and goldberg when they were both leaving and um, because he wanted to be a football player it didn't quite work out because he didn't have that background of being a football player that happens to that's when the kind of ego comes into people that have a lot of money and fame where they, they think they can try their hand at anything. Um, it even happened to the great Michael Jordan, so there's nothing to be ashamed of. In terrible, that. terrible um, match, terrible yeah, match. <clears throat> terrible match. Austin trying to, uh, I mean, Austin was the best worker in the match and he was, uh, <laughs> he was the ref, you know, so he was the only one trying to get the crowd. And we all know those Madison Square crowd is unforgiving. Um, Remember me even the, trying to get the two boys to lock up and actually wrestle even. Yeah, it was it was tough, it was, it tough was tough very man. tough. I, I, I find that as a former worker, uh, well, once a worker, always a worker. I find that difficult to watch even today because I'm like I can't pinpoint it at and that the boys done wrong. It was just they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the and and the information was leaked, unfortunately. And and, and that just, New York crowd as well, you know, they didn't they didn't have any time for either of them, and they let it be known. No, tough crowd in New York, MSG. You're yeah, not going to get yeah. away with much there with those and you well educated and, and, who, crowd. and who were the losers here? You know, the audience, because they didn't allow them to put on a show, and all the people who paid to watch the pay per view, you know, didn't see a show because the audience ruined it for them. That's 100% correct. About, 100% talk correct. about smart fans outsmarting themselves. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, that bugged me. That bugged me a lot. Yeah. I mean, obviously, people you know, pays the monies and they can respond how they wish. You know, that's technically is true. But I think as a fan, you, you also, you know, when, when you buy that ticket, you're entering into a sort of mini contract with the company. And if you're purposely going there to ruin the show, then, you know, why are you there? You're not much of a fan. Yeah. So, I mean, it was... Yeah. I mean, it was obviously a very memorable match for all the wrong reasons, but you know, a real shame for for those two guys who I think really did want to put on a, put on a match, and yeah. for Steve Austin as well, who made the best of a bad situation. And but yeah, for all of us watching it, it was just like, well, thanks MSG crowd, thanks for ruining it for mm. us. And New York, yeah. you know it. Yeah, for anyone that knows uh, that and, promo, and such and such an iconic WrestleMania as well. You know, it yeah. was a shame that it didn't, you know, fit into the rest of the card, really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, Brock takes a little break, um, goes to New Japan for a little bit, um, you know, has, has you know, some some good work over there. We're not going to kind of dwell on it too much, but um, gets into the UFC, which was just absolutely humongous at the time and quickly 
establishes himself as the biggest pay-per-view draw at that time. And even to this day, still not far behind Ireland's own Conor McGregor in terms of some of his, uh, some of his, his pay-per-view numbers. Um, first match obviously loses to Frank Mir just with a little uh, ankle a heel lock. I remember it very well. Um, I was a Frank Mir fan as well, so it was actually kind of torn between these two boys. <laughs> it was like because the pro wrestler in me was going, "Oh, I want to see Brock," you know, show that you know some of these wrestlers can be legit. But then at the same time, I know that Frank Mir is kind of a, uh, you know, the real deal as well. Um, but Back again. Yeah. Back again. No, we're back. Of course, yeah. Sorry, I don't know where I lost is there, guys. You know, in in this wonderful uh, land of Ireland, um, you know, as soon as the weather's bad, the internet connection tends to go. And yeah. um, this is what yeah. we get for our money over here. You know, this is where our valuable taxes go um, to yeah. fix the internet. Can't be sued over that because our government is shit. But anyway, as I was saying, <laughs> as I was saying. Um, as I was saying, um, where did I lose you guys? I was talking about Frank Mir and Brock Lesnar, right? Yeah, yeah no, you were talking yeah, you were about talking... Brock and his draw of value. And, yes, and how yes. And obviously his first his first match he lost, obviously, he was actually beating the absolute living shit out of Frank Mir. He was getting those hammer fists in and, you know, showing his dominance and just left his ankle in there. I remember it well. Just left his ankle in there right at the worst spot you can for a nice little heel hook. And the tap came, but he didn't really lose face over that one because it was like, whoa, um, the rematch, he absolutely killed him. Um, and I'm a Frank Mir fan as well. So I was kind of like torn between. That's what I was trying to say, because I like Frank Mir. Um, so it was kind of one of those where I wanted the pro wrestler to succeed because it's a pro wrestler coming into the real fight world. So it was yeah. kind of like, you know, I, yeah, I'm kind of rooting for him, even though Brock wasn't necessarily your stereotypical pro wrestling guy because he wasn't necessarily a fan of the business, um, you know, first and foremost, and kind of let it be known at the time. But still, you know, he, he, he still owed, you know, everything that he became to it, so to speak. Um, but he had a great career in the UFC. And obviously, I cannot pronounce this word, uh, diverticulitis. Like, diverticulitis. Diverticulitis, there we go. Yeah, um, the one thing That's... I can do, I can I can pronounce any word when it comes to medical terms, I am out. <laughs> I am out. <laughs> um, but, you know, even, even that match with Alistair Overeem shouldn't have happened, you know what I mean? Because I would like to see that again with two full fit boys. I think Brock would absolutely destroy him um, because one is just a steroid freak, you know what I mean, in Overeem. And that showed when he was off the juice um, that he still wasn't a great fighter. In, well, no, he's a great fighter. What I mean is he's, he's had some bad losses in that, I think, whereas you look at Brock, you know, you can't always be accused of being that big because of the because of the juice, because he literally showed that at 19 years of age that he wasn't. He was, you know what I mean? Um but, but, but yeah, that was his UFC career was phenomenal. And then, of course, he did make a return while he was still in WWE and showed how pro wrestling is king and came back and beat the piss out of Mark Hunt as well. A really tough guy and actually beat him uh, very badly um, with, with, with the fists this time. So I think Brock's uh, UFC career would have been very, very interesting if he hadn't have got hurt because he was definitely evolving as a fighter. Um, but then he came back to WWE, the return of Brock, the part-time Brock, which really infuriated fans, Finley. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he left WWE in 2004. I mean, that massively infuriated Vince McMahon because he just signed that new long-term deal. And then he decided, you know, I want to be a football player. I mean, he's talked about this. I think there was a lot of factors that led him through the WWE exit. He was sick of the schedule, being away from home. I think he had a, a daughter at the time. He wanted to see more of her. And um, he just didn't like the lifestyle. Um, I think there was talk in late, late 2004, I think it was, that he might return after the vo football thing. And, you know, he'd obviously f flopped in. Uh, he'd, I think he'd been signed to a developmental contract with the Minnesota Vikings. Like and then he could him because his football skills weren't up to par. Then he was getting desperate. Um, 
when WWE gave him the release from his contract, he could do football and he could do other things, but he couldn't do fighting and he couldn't do wrestling for the duration of the contract, which I think was something like five years. Was it five or seven years? It was a long time anyway. It was Ten, I think it was, wasn't it? It was a whole decade, yeah. actually, yeah. I think, yeah. I think it was seven years rings a bell. I don't yeah. think it was 10 years, but it was many years. And he ended up going to court, and that went on and on and on. And finally, um, he was given his uh, release from the contract and was able to work for New Japan Pro Wrestling. I think he made his debut for them in October 2005. That wasn't really successful, that run, but he was able to make some money. He left New Japan summer 2006, then started training for fighting. And as you say, made his UFC debut, was it February 2008? I think it was. It was correct, yeah. Yeah, yeah. February 2008, he was, I mean, that first uh, pay-per-view featuring him and Frank Mir was a huge success on pay-per-view and all subsequent um, matches he had did very well, some better than others. I think a few broke the one million buy yeah. barrier, didn't they? I mean, he was yeah. did fabulously successfully in, in yeah. UFC in terms remember of the, the You remember the famous pro wrestling promo that they accused him of where he said, fuck Bud Light. He goes, I'm going to go home, fuck my wife and have a Coors Light. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, he had to apologize. Uh, then and, the, and, and, the, he, and heck, I might even jump on my wife. Heck, I might even jump on my wife. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, that's what it was. And my he, uh, he had to apologize yeah. in the uh, yeah. post uh, match press conference because of his uh, antics. language and probably not endorsing the sponsor of the yeah. event, right? Of course, <laughs> that was the main reason he was, he was culpable, you know. <laughs> so as you said, I mean, he, he had he had the the, the illness, uh, and then he made the comeback, and then I think the illness recurred. I think it did, and it was you know it was really you know just really tough for him. But obviously, it established his you know pay per view credentials as a draw. So we should just say that he did negotiate with Vince McMahon in two thousand five about comeback in summer two thousand five, and they wanted him back. And there was some talk that they would be able to reach a deal, but they were, it just didn't happen. And what Brock wanted was he wanted the part-time deal. He, if he was going back to WWE, he just wanted to, you know, work TV tapings. He didn't want to go on the road anymore. And Vince is like, no way. There's no way I can sign you to that because it would set a dangerous precedent. Now, by the time his UFC career had ended, he made so much money that he didn't need WWE. And he's, he'd established himself as you know, the biggest draw on pay-per-view, um, certainly in MMA and wrestling. So when the talks opened with Vince in 2012, um, he, you know, there, was a diff there wasn't a power imbalance. Actually, the power imbalance had shifted to Brock's favour. So he got the deal he wanted, returned the night after WrestleMania in 2012, didn't he, when he attacked John Cena on Raw? Yeah. Yeah, famous yeah. power slam cover. Brock Lesnar is back, and he's there, and he's looking at the camera. Tremendous cover, um, and that led to the John Cena match, didn't it? Extreme Rules, which was hell of a performance. Really tough match, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, hard way. <laughs> um, yeah, I was watching that kind of going. I don't envy John. In this position, right now, but, uh, no. yeah. took a, I mean, took a, took a, took like a champ, took like a champ, and even even so much so that the boys got work behind the stage, and uh, Chris Jericho tried to put it up to Brock Lesnar for all of his sins. Um, that was the Rand, that was the Randy Orton one when he spoke. Sorry, that was a Randy Orton one. My apologies. Randy, and, uh, and, Randy and, one, and, yeah. and what was Brock Lesnar's reaction? He just laughed at him and walked away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and Randy I mean, was like, "It's okay." It's all good, we, Chris. We, we we were remiss not to mention as well, Finley. Probably the worst tattoo in the history of wrestling. That sword tattoo that he got that time when Vince was dragging him through the courts. Remember, he got the tattoo sword right up to his neck, and it was like he had the sword to his trout kind of thing. That was a kicker at Vince. Remember back in the day? Oh, oh yeah, tattoo. I, terrible tattoo. I remember. <laughs> I remember. I remember. Yeah, he had it in two thousand five. You're right. And I remember running a photo of Brock on the cover of Power Slam from his comeback match, which I think was a triple threat match with Mazachono. 
I'm not sure who the other person in that match was, yeah. but Lesnar was on the front cover of Power Slam, and that issue did really well. Yeah. And yeah. the cover line read, read, Brock really is back. And he's there doing the F5 on, I think it was Chono. Because earlier in the year, he made the appearance at the um, January 4th Dome show. He'd been there with Reno, with Sable, as like a, as a guest of Antonio Inoki's. He didn't That's wrestle. Right, and um, WWE was not happy about that at all because, well, you know, they were not happy about it. And that led to more problems. Uh, and by the time October came round, they'd reached an agreement in the courts and Lesnar was able to wrestle for New Japan. And yeah, we had Brock on the cover, but he was always great value for money. Oh, yeah, actually, as, uh, yeah, I do remember that epi- that issue now, funny enough. Yeah, yeah. because uh, like I said, I pretty much had... I, don't, I should have just had a like a monthly subscription from you. I was got it sent, but I was just able to buy it, so it's okay. We we, we had good, uh, you had good coverage over here in, yeah. in Ireland, Finn. Yeah, I'll, you just to just keep talking. I'll see if I can find a copy of that issue. Just yeah, hundred percent. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I, I think realistically, when you look at a uh, Brock Noyle, like such a such a stop start relationship with the company. And yet you look at the relationship now with the company mm. and it's 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 just tailor made to be ongoing and you know until Brock wants it not to be, right? Yeah, I think when you're I think when you've become as big as him, like he's a household name now and he's a global star and he's a massive draw. Uh, I think the company sometimes has to bend a little bit to suit your situation as well if they want to bring you in. Um but like I mean, if you look at him now, I mean he's just he looks like he's back in love with the business. He looks like he's enjoying it. And we always say, I mean, when we talk about Brock Lesnar, we're talking about a guy that if he's fully involved and engrossed in it and happy to be working with those guys, that's when you see the best of Brock Lesnar. When you see him in these situations where he doesn't want to be involved or something, like that, that's when you see the switch off is huge as well. You know, so, that's it. And I mentioned that match that he had with uh, with the demon Finn Balor, obviously, um that time. Uh, I know we talked about it before, Finn, um, where you could see him actually going out of his way to sell for Finn. You know what I mean? Like when they that little switch where they were out at the table, and he obviously gets hit in the you know in the gut, and that's playing on the on the and the illness. And yeah. you know he really went out of his way, and he so like I really when Brock wants to sell, there's not many better in the business, especially for a man of his size because he's so athletic. He really oh, yeah, puts yeah. his heart and soul into it. Like, I don't think there's anyone better, personally. Um, because I know, like, I know what it takes to sell and, like, to make it look realistic. And, and But he really, really does put his heart and soul into it for a guy of his size um, when he appreciates the worker that he's in with. And, a pre, you know, it, it's, yeah, he's, he, I just think he's fantastic. When he's on his A game, good Lord, is there many better you know, near 300 pounders than, than Brock Lesnar. Oh, well, no, I agree. I agree. And by the way, I can't find a copy of issue 136 Power Slam. Apologies. So don't <laughs> attempt to call Finn to buy a copy because he doesn't have one for himself. I, don't, I have a copy somewhere, but sadly I can't find it at the moment. That's I okay. mean, this may look quite tidy, but this, this room I'm in is not tidy. And this is, this is you know, this is hiding a, a multitude of sins, you know. So uh, come on, Finn. There's such, t- there's such thing as journalist kayfabe as well. Come on, don't tell yeah. them what's behind there. Don't tell them what's in front of you. Come on, <laughs> don't open, don't open that forbidden door. Uh, right load of rubbish. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm with you about I'm, I'm <laughs> with you about Lesnar. Just amazing performance uh, when it comes to selling. I mean, watch his, uh, you know, the way in which he sold for Drew McIntyre at the Royal Rumble 2020. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just the way you know, he took the um, the claymore, yeah. went flying over the top rope at ringside. He's just like, What's happened? And you know, you could learn so much from that performance yeah, from that one cell job of that one kick. Yeah. And he got himself over more with the way he sold than really Drew got over, um, by sending him out of the ring and um, you know, just um. You, know, you can learn so if I was a wrestler, I'd be looking at Brock <coughs> Lesnar, I'd be saying, Why is this guy so over? You know, and it's obviously he's got the pedigree and he's got the aura, and that comes from success and doing it for many years. 
But there are things that he does that other people don't do. I tell you, someone else who does a lot of this as well, Walter or Gunther, as he now is, yeah. in NXT 2.0. I would agree, yeah. Did, I mean, did you see the, you see the match he had on NXT UK with Nathan Fraser? No, no. Yeah, well, it was uh, Walter's last stand uh, in NXT UK. That was last month. I think it was the January 15th. I think it was the January 15th episode of NXT UK. And... Um, sometime in mid-January anyway. And, you know, Walter's performance reminded me of Lesnar's with the way in which he sold for Fraser. He was a smaller guy, obviously nowhere near the star, you know, nowhere near, you know, having the aura or the prestige that Walter had. But Walter sold for Fraser so much in that match that, you know, you were invested in it. You were like, wow, this Fraser guy might just pull off the upset because Walter is giving him so much, he's selling for so much for him. He's, he's just, you know, making him appear to be on his level, making the match appear to be competitive. You know, and that's what it's all about, is dragging the audience into the match. Imagine if Hogan that. had have agreed that in 1992 or 1993, you know? It'd be a different conversation about yeah. Hogan. But it's just about creating that emotional connection with the audience, yeah. making the audience believe that this match could end. And that there's this a person, chance. There's a chance. Yeah. That, yeah. That this person could score this upset, and because Walter was selling so much for Fraser, um, you know, deep down you knew that Fraser wasn't going to win, but you were willing to suspend your disbelief for a few moments. Then, when he went for those near falls and you know, kept avoiding um, the power bomb, And it was a really good match, actually. I would recommend it to you, the uh, the Walter yeah. versus Nathan Fraser match. Um, and, you know, I'm hoping one day that we see Walter Gunther versus Brock Lesnar. I mean, I don't know whether the match will work as well as we imagine it might, because the styles are maybe a little bit too similar. But it's a match I still would very much like to see. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I've said this before, you know, Walter, even though he's big with some of the guys that he that he, he faces, like with the likes of, you know, Jordan Devlin and, and guys like that. So he looks bigger than those guys because he is. I actually ran into uh, when I was in in the airport um, a couple of years back, just before the pandemic. Um, he was over here for a show here in Ireland and he was he was going to be working with Jordan. And uh, I'd actually been texting Jordan Devlin that that day. And just so happened to get on a, the same shuttle bus. And I realized who's this big German looking fella. And there he is. That's Walter. And I was like, hey, how are you doing, buddy? Jordan says hello. And he goes, what? I said, Jordan Devlin. <laughs> I showed him the text thread. And he goes, oh, very good. <laughs> you know, he's like, he went back and sat and said, I didn't bother him. I, you know, I, I know, you know, that's. I'm not a mark, look. Like, so it was kind of just like it was just more funny because I happened to have the phone in my hand and I was going through the thread. I said, Jesus, there you go. Mm. Didn't even ask for a picture or whatever because it was just more, you know, it, 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 I was just trying to fuck with him basically. I was trying to rib him. Mm. And uh, I, I remember looking back at him on the bus and he was kind of looking in my direction as if to say, I don't understand what this guy is doing. <laughs> so, Walter, mm. if you ever listen to the show, I was only kidding. Mm. Don't beat the shit out of me. But um, the, he the, did a great job that night as well with Jordan, funny enough. He as well, did. Actually. He did a great job. Yeah, and totally, that's, yeah. you know, I, I, I see where Finley's coming from with, with that. He, mm. he does have that kind of ability to be able to throw his body around and make the smaller guy look legit. He has that David versus Goliath. Very similar to uh, Bam Bam Bigelow, actually. Um, you know, Bam Bam was, was a big guy. And when yeah. Bam Bam sold, good Lord, I don't think there was a better proper super heavyweight than Bam Bam. Um, in my opinion, Yokozuna, when he didn't have the weight, was was good, but you know what I mean for his size. But I think Bam Bam was just. Well, Vader was really good. Vader, Vader was, really was good as well. Vader yeah, was very. Before. Vader was very good, but I still think Bam Bam is. Uh, I still think Bam Bam is just a little, little bit above for me. Um, yeah. Just a little bit for me, and not as and not as stiff and sometimes rugged. You know, when you yeah. kind of when you kind of take uh, when you go into business for yourself, even one time, um, you kind of lose a little bit of credibility. Um, and I think Vader done that one too many times for me, whereas I think Bam Bam didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. He, he was. He was. Well, I mean, well, Vader did it with the characters Jack matches, but that was all. 
you know, at Cactus's request, wasn't it? I mean, if yeah. you look at Vader's Vader's matches with Sting, Sting's Sting, they were probably the best matches of Sting's career with Vader. Oh, I would famous, agree. I would agree. Yeah. Um, a strap match from Super Brawl three would have been, I think it was. Well, didn't Ric and, Flair um, say he could be? Ric Flair said he could kind of go into. Yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. The Starcade ninety three match. Yes, yes, um, yeah. that's the one. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know Flair, I think, lost some teeth. He took a really bad shot to the face. Yeah. yeah. And Vader was stiff. But I'm, I don't know whether he was a guy that ever really set out to hurt anyone. No, 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 no. 100%. That's not what I'm saying. I, I yeah. agree with 100 Whereas I just think Bam Bam, for a guy his size, so agile on his feet. Like, yeah. If, good Lord. Like, he used to bounce around at 400 pounds almost on his yeah, feet. And yeah. you're going, whoa. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, his matches with Taz in ECW, Taz, they were the best matches of Taz's career by a wide margin. Um, Rob Van Dam had some of the best matches of his career against Bam Bam. And uh, he was a tremendous performer as Bam Bam Bigel, there's no doubt about that. Oh, unbelievable. Um, so going back to Brock then, and, 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 and talking about the return, I suppose if we talk about the here and now, um, he's obviously returned recently. Um, you'll know the date probably off the top of your head, Finn. I am yeah, we, we returned at SummerSlam last year. I mean, he yeah. dropped the belt to Drew at WrestleMania in 2020. Yes. Um, and then disappeared. And um, after Roman Reigns had beaten John Cena at SummerSlam last year, uh, Les now returned after the match and squared off with, with Reigns, which brings us to where we are now. This is the exciting part. I mean, I think now a lot of people kind of slag Brock's kind of little pineapple haircut, which I think is really cool. And I thought he looked absolutely super cool during the uh, in the Royal Rumble, the way he had it all plaid, like he looked like a proper Viking coming to war. Um, Noel and Finn, in terms of where we go from here, what are your predictions? There are talks, and Finn, you will know, You'll probably have your ear to the ground a little bit, um, a little bit better than we will in terms of what what the word on the street is, in terms of um, how the possibility that they're looking to unify the belts and stuff like that is is going on. I don't know whether that's the case or whether because obviously with with, with TV deals, don't really see that being a thing. But you know, what do you predict? Um, you know, upcoming. You know, well, we've got Elimination it. Chamber this Saturday. Yeah. We've got Bobby Lashley's WWE champion. He's defending, and Lesnar is in the match. Now, Lesnar, of course, won the Rumble and then uh, revealed on Raw two nights later because Raw Rumble was a Saturday. Yes. Now the big show's on Saturdays. Let's not forget. It's great for so, us, uh, UK and Ireland people. So it's. Absolutely, yeah. If you if you're one of the one of the people who stays up late and watches them live, I'm not one of those people. I am, unfortunately, for my sins. <laughs> right. So he announced on Raw um, two nights after Raw Rumble, Lesnar did that he he would challenge Roman Reigns for the Universal Title at WrestleMania, and this was in a segment with Bobby Lashley. And in the same segment with Lashley, Lesnar declared that he was gonna beat Lashley for the WWE title at Elimination Chamber, and then it was going to be title versus title at WrestleMania. So, I mean, that is feasible. That could happen. I don't think it will because, you know, if someone unifies the belts, then what happens? And they need a belt, they need a championship on Raw, they need a championship on SmackDown. So how do they undo the unification? And whenever they've done anything like this in the past, they've always had to roll back on it. They've always had to, you know, basically go back to the position they were in before they unified the belts. And it's always a bit sort of awkward and never that smooth. And it just never seems, you know, you, you look at it, and you think, well, what was the point of that? If you didn't really have a plan for this person as a unified champion. Yeah. The only way it works is if it's like, the unified champ then works on both shows, but that's really too much to ask for from one person. And it also doesn't cure the house show problem because then that means that you've only got the champion wrestling on one house show. 
And you haven't got a champion on a Raw and both Raw and SmackDown house shows. So anyway, it's cut a long story short. I don't think they're going to unify the belts because I don't think it really serves any valuable purpose and certainly not long term. It might be good for a cheap one night pop, but that's all it's really good for. And then you've got the, you know, the 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 difficulty of taking one of the belts off somebody in a match. So, you know, if say it's Roman Reigns, Universal and WWE champion, and then he faces, say, Big E at the next pay-per-view, which title does he defend? Why is he only defending one of the belts and not both? It just becomes kind of tricky, doesn't it, to, to book in a way that's commonsensical. Mm-hmm, it just yeah. beca- You're just creating awkwardness for yourself, I think, by unifying the belt. So I believe that Lashley will return at Elimination Chamber and then Lesnar will go on to face Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. Now, I think that has to be the night on which Roman Reigns finally receives his comeuppance. That's my prediction. What do you two think? Uh-huh. Yeah, I was I was kind of thinking along the same, Finley. I think it's very hard to unify the belts and then you find yourself with two shows. One doesn't have a belt on it. He's not going to go across both shows. And then you kind of have to whip a belt back off and next night or something like that. And then the whole build up to the Mania match and all is kind of irrelevant then because you're never going to hang on to the titles or unify them. Um, I, I think I think you could be right, but I think we could be looking at um, the second swerve back of Paul Heyman. I know he swerved out for Roman. And I think maybe the plan with him and Lesnar was that Lesnar planted him in there on the road to WrestleMania. You get the swerve back again. And then Roman beats uh, Reigns, gets the belt, but Heyman's with with uh, Lesnar. Right, yeah, yeah. So yeah. like a like a double swerve, if you like. I think you could be right about that. Yeah. Um, I think you could be right about that, but that then results in Lesnar beating Reigns at WrestleMania. Yeah. So Reigns is finally someone is finally beating Reigns. Yeah. And Reigns is then because that they will then change the Reigns character. I mean, yeah. I don't think he's getting stale as champion, but at some point he has to lose the belt. Yeah. And if it's not to Lesnar at the end of this story, then to whom will he finally lose the belt? And you could yeah. say, well, maybe Bron Breaker, but it's too soon for him and he's NXT yeah. champion at the moment anyway. Yeah. Or you could say Gable Stevenson, but I mean, it's it would be too soon for him. Yeah. He couldn't really become champion until, I mean, say he debuts in the summer. You couldn't really make him champion for, you know, until the end of the year or maybe Royal Rumble next year or WrestleMania yeah. next year. And the SmackDown roster for Reigns at his level at the moment is quite shallow, really, isn't it? Because Nakamura came across, obviously Jeff Hardy came across and went, um, but Nakamura's in there, but I'm not too sure. Um, it, it It's, yeah, there's not a lot of options there for him, really, um, in terms of, you know, at that level. Um so I think, yeah, I think I think you could be right, but I think I think obviously Reigns can come out of it still looking strong if there's some involvement there from Heyman or something like that on the double. Well, screen. he's he's gonna he's gonna have a pivotal role in this without yeah. a shadow of a doubt. Um, yeah. I, I I think you will see the Heyman Brock, you know. Personally, I think you will see the Heyman Brock um switcheroo at, at Mania. I'm predicting it now. I know you're looking up to the heavens there, Finley, and you might no, not no, agree no, with no, me. No, 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 you're right. I, I think that's gonna happen because yeah. That enables Roman Reigns to save face, doesn't it? Exactly. And, and that's exactly where my point of view was coming from. Mm. And and possibly you, you might be able to potentially listen, engage the crowd and possibly see if you can maybe have a little bit of a heel turn or a baby face turn as well in the process. Possibly. Possibly. I don't yeah, think... Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm only saying... Like, you know that these riders, they have literally 1,589 riders at the moment <laughs> so <laughs> maybe one maybe 60 um but no they are going to be marking all of this stuff down you know what i mean they're going to be writing all these kind of ideas down so i'm just trying to think what they could possibly be coming up with and it, it, it's a possibility that you know they could be saying can we switch brock back heel or can we switch you know reigns baby face or can we you know i personally wouldn't do it i think reigns is fine where he is um but it, it it is a possibility. What say you, Finley? Uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, at some point he is going to have to turn, isn't he? And yeah. the thing is, obviously, 
he's golden at the moment is Roman Reigns. And you don't want to, sometimes you don't want to start tinkering with something that's working so well. Yeah. And I think there is mileage left in Reigns as a heel. To we me, do. he's the best all-rounder in the biz. The yes. Nearest, you know, the near Lesnar is the, the closest candidate to him in terms of, you know, aura and just all around star power and just knowing what to do. I mean, I thought Reigns versus Seth freaking Rollins at Royal Rumble was actually a, a really amazing match. Great and they, match. And they managed to get away with the non-finish, which was quite a feat, I thought, that they yeah. were actually able to make. And, and I'm hoping that that's going to lead to a no DQ match between them somewhere down the line. It really has to. So um, you would hope that they book that finish for that purpose. But I mean, yeah, Reigns, is it time to turn in baby face yet? Maybe not. But sometimes I think you've got to do these things before someone's appeal starts to diminish. Exactly. You want to do it when they're still hot, when they're still fresh in that role, not when mm. they've passed their peak. Yeah. You know, you want to do it when they're still going up, not when they're going down. Yeah. So maybe WrestleMania is the time to, to do the turn. And yeah. I think Ray, yeah. as this character, as a face, won't be that much different. He just won't cheat in his matches. That will be the only change. And there'll be a slight change in the way he speaks to the audience. But when he says, acknowledge me, it'll be done in a way where people um, feel comfortable cheering him, not booing him. Mm -hmm. And it'll only take a slight shift, I think, in his demeanour to provoke that reaction because he's so over. Well, it can almost be like the uh, the, the, the Austin anti-hero type thing, you know what I mean? In that sense that he doesn't necessarily need to change his whole demeanour and be like, hey, guys, I love you, buy my T-shirt, you know what I mean? You know, the John <laughs> Cena route. Uh, you know, you people pay good money and you can boo me all you want, but you you deserve to boo me because you pay that good money. You know, yeah. that used to be cringeworthy and poor old John Cena had to do it, you know? Um, whereas Reigns is kind of in that boat where he can kind of, not necessarily change the coolness of his persona, but, you know, like, acknowledge me. It can be more like Austin where he can still flip the bird. He can still, you know, yeah. have that aura, but they, they will generally shift. And it depends on how hard dumb boy Reigns gets done. It's it's like that old, you know, the, the switcheroo yeah. at WrestleMania 13. You know what I mean? If, they're, if they can really yeah. be intricate and articulate it in a way that the crowd can, 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 um, correspond with it and comprehend it mm. then they will yeah. then you will get that sympathy and it's like it yeah. sounds like a more simple like a more difficult process than it is but it really is a simple formula if done yeah. if done correctly that's, um, that's and, and when someone's over to the level that reigns is it's very easy to pull this yes. type of thing off absolutely it's it's manipulation it's psychology yeah. you know what i mean it's 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 and it's a wonderful thing when when it's done right um, look, I suppose we, 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 we've kind of, uh, as we as we wrap up here, any kind of closing statements on um, on Brock and, and where you see uh, Brock, say, in the next two to three years? Do you still see him in WWE? Do you think he's, he's, he's kind of got that little fire back that he's happy to to wrestle on this part-time contract and, and, and be, a, be a player the way he is? And even at the, he's shown up a lot more than... Than in previous years. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's there all the time. He's there basically every week now. I mean, the character you see, he's incorporated a lot more comedy into his routine now. Yes. And he, he stated in the Pat McAfee interview that went out yesterday and um, that he's having a lot of fun with it right now. And you can see that he's he's just having a blast. I he's mean, happy. Be, I, think, I think he was born in 77. So I think he's 44. 44. Four now, yeah, so uh, but to me, you know that that's no age. And I mean, years ago, like thirty years ago, if you were forty-four, it's like, oh, it's all over for him. Yeah. That's really no age at all in wrestling. So I'd say he's got two, three good years left in him, easy. I mean, yeah. you can see that he's still in great shape. He's not wrestling that often. He doesn't wrestle really long matches, as we know. He doesn't actually take that many bumps. It's his poor, unfortunate opponents that are sent flying through the air most of the time. So I think he's I think he's good for a few years few years yet, um, and obviously WWE can afford him. They've just made record profits, so they can afford to pay Brock with you know whatever he asks for within reason. Um, so yeah, I think I think he's going to stick around for a few years yet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how his character development continues. He seems to be really enjoying peel back the, the layers of this onion and not be so heavily reliant on Paul Heyman. He's bringing his own character now to the screen and that hopefully that's going to continue to develop, you know, so it's going to be really cool. Yeah. Well, look, until next time, Finley, we will probably have our next quarterly meeting probably just maybe after Mania, somewhere around the, around the May june mark yes and we'll kind of be getting closer to SummerSlam and on to the next journey and the next season i suppose we'll be we'll be a couple of months into that season and see see where we go from there but um yeah for for uh you know want to thank you and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what has happened at wrestlemania and mm -hmm. where we are then maybe reigns yeah. will be the baby face lesnar and heyman over the heels mm -hmm. You know, and, it, and it'll be interesting to to sort of assess where we are at the time and uh, and where we're going from there. So yeah, look for yeah, May. Let's make it May time. I'll come yeah. back there. Absolutely, now. May time sounds good. Yeah, because it's I cool do as think. well because we're we're coming up to thirty years of SummerSlam '92, Finley as well. So that should be really really cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Oof. I, I was oh. there for that. <laughs> I was there in spirit, possibly, possibly, arguably one of the greatest professional wrestling matches of all time. Um, between, you know, one of your own and uh, and the greatest. Davey, yeah. Davey and Brett, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah it was uh, quite an experience on the night, that's for sure. But uh, but yeah, thirty years, yeah, in August in SummerSlam, yeah, it's um, where does the time go? I don't know. My girlfriend was born that year. So, <laughs> God, I'm like, whoa. In fact, she wasn't even born when that match happened. Well, yeah. There you go. Oh, no, it was only six. Come on. I'm not, I'm not that old. <laughs> um, but no, it, it, it's been a pleasure today, guys. I think, you know, 20 years of Brock and many, many more, hopefully, going forward. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please make sure you do like and subscribe and comment on this video and let us know your thoughts and opinions on uh, everything that we've discussed today. And um, before you go, Finley, why don't you let people know where they can find you and what you've got going on. Um, you, you are a busy man, so you've always got something going on. Yeah, well, I do have, even though I couldn't find a copy of issue 136, a power slam, I do have a copy of issue 17, of Inside the Ropes magazine, so that's on sale now. The great so stinger the on the cover. Yeah, with the sting on the front cover. So at least I have one of the magazines. I'm slightly on the ball. So if you want to know more about the magazine, issue 18 is out, is on sale next week, February 24th. And that features Ronda Rousey on the cover. So you can, uh, more details about the magazine, uh, you'll find at insidetheropesmagazine.com. So, yeah, next issue is out uh, February 24th. So which that's course, what I've got going on. Yeah, which, of course, you do um, you do write uh, in, in that magazine as well. That's it, yeah. I did uh, a lot in the latest issue. I did the Royal Rumble review. I uh, do a QA, and a I do, like, uh, the news section. I do a two-page column. So, uh, yeah, um, big part of the latest issue, or the next issue, rather. So please check that out. You can never get rid of the old line. He slowly gets up there, 18 issues in, and he's taken over. He's not here to take part. He's here to take over. Pillar, pillar to post. Yeah. Great, great, well, ma yeah. great magazine. Um, a magazine that I, I'm literally up to date on. And uh, I obviously always support my good brother, Finley, and, uh, and the great product that they put out. So I do implore everybody and anybody to get it for all of our Irish fans that are here on the Emerald Oil. Of course, Eason's do, um, do hold it. Um, so go there and get your copy. Um, and I'm sure if you go onto the website, you can find many ways to subscribe to it and get it delivered to your door. I'm sure. Absolutely. You still have exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate those, those, uh, those kind remarks. Thanks very much. Ian. My pleasure. My pleasure, sir. Uh, Noel, again, my right hand man. Always, uh, always a pleasure to have you on, sir. Absolutely. A pleasure being on as always. Absolutely. And until next week, Never forget the talc, never forget the dynamo, never forget to shop in Wrestling Mania in Dublin's St. Stephen's Green at the very, very top floor. Tell them Eno sent you. Hey, even tell them Noel sent you. He's here. He'll remember it. And, of course, subscribe to that great magazine, Inside the Ropes. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, I am your host, Eno Dynamo Kelly. But until next time, we are over and out.